So I want to talk about electronic books. And, um, and when I say books, I don't necessarily mean just the, the physical objects. Uh, I mean more the, the conceptual object of a book and the economics of what it means to be a book author and a, and a publisher of books. Uh, you know, what is this as a commercial enterprise as well as, as, a, uh, you know, as, as a thing that people read? Um, so I've been at this for a very long time. Uh, uh, I published my first book in 1992, I believe it was, um, in both print and electronic form, and nobody really cared. Uh, it, you know, it just, the world was not ready yet. Um, and I was by no means the, the only one. There was a lot of people doing interesting things with electronic publishing. Um, you know, this um, didn't work. You know, it, even if it had been technically possible, um, people didn't want to read books on some big clunky desktop computer. Uh, there were a lot of problems with the distribution channels to, you know, how do you sell something for $10 that you have to put on a CD and, you know, and then the internet kind of came along and gave away a lot of the same kind of material for free and created a, 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 a free environment as opposed to a, it's a book that you buy environment for things. Um, also, I just did the math, a copy of the Elements iPad app uh, on floppy disk is 4,250 floppy disks. Um, so, you know, the world wasn't ready yet. Um, and so uh, what, what myself and my colleagues did uh, was spend 20 years um, being packaged software developers because that's something for which there was a market and which you, know, you could build a company on. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Wolfram Research. Our product is Mathematica, um, which is hopefully reasonably familiar to, to those of you in education. Um, you know, we've spent 22 years building this up as a piece of uh, uh, software, which is quite widely used, particularly in education. Um, we have site licenses at most major universities. Um, and it's been, I think, a, you know, a reasonably effective tool for change in education in terms of giving uh, powerful tools, putting them in the hands of students. Um, it's been used in what I at least think are some of the more interesting uh, attempts at education reform, calculus and Mathematica, for example, a CNM courseware uh, also originally published in the very early 90s, uh, remains, I think, to this day, one of the most interesting examples of real interactive electronic publishing in which students are able to interact with, in a deep and meaningful way, the content of the courseware that they're using. Um, you probably haven't heard of it. Um, it has had essentially no impact on calculus teaching other than for the few people who love it um, and who appreciate its power. Um, and it's kind of sad, really, that uh, after so much time in which there are really nice examples like this available, people are still teaching calculus. I don't mean to single out calculus, it's just a particularly crystal clear example of where there's a tremendous opportunity for progress and yet none has been made. That people still have these huge thick calculus textbooks that teach calculus the same way it's been taught for 50 years and hasn't made sense for 20 years. Um, uh, there's, there's just a lot of, of uh, you know, progress that could be made. And, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why it didn't happen was because teachers were free to ignore it, uh, and so they, they took the easy path and did. Um, um, so, that, so uh, you know, we, we've taken some other approaches. For example, we've recently uh, released the Wolfram Alpha website, which is a, a free website. Anyone can go to it. Uh, and it, it puts into the hands of anyone with a web browser most of the power of Mathematica, all of the computational capabilities of Mathematica, uh, plus a huge amount of additional um, uh, things that you can do involving you know, real-world data sources. Um, and it's just sort of there, and it's not something that uh, a teacher can take away from a student, um, including, for example, at uh, calculus. You know, it, it simply does the homework. Um, it removes the need for anyone to do the, the, the manual algorithms of, of uh, calculus, which shouldn't have been taught in the way they have been for 20 years. It, it makes it more difficult because students s simply have access to this tool now, and it's more difficult for teachers to ignore that fact. Um, I like to think of it as a bit of sort of guerrilla education reform. Um, and if you're not an aficionado of calculus education, you may not appreciate the significance of this, but I think it's kind of fun that we can do this now. 
uh, and, and that, that we really can't be ignored. Um, anyway, so um, that's just a little bit of background about where I'm coming from. My perspective is that of a commercial software publisher um, who's made a living for um, you know, 22 years selling software both to commercial and to educational users. Um, but actually, uh, what, what I think I'm actually here, why, why I was invited had very little to do with that. Um, and it's actually to do with a little bit of a, a confusion and, and sidetrack that I got on uh, in 2002, um, which I think has, has now come to serve as a nice example, uh, sort of microcosm of, um, that illustrates just how dramatic the changes in electronic publishing are in the last year or two. Um, so way, uh, way back in 2002, I read this wonderful book, Uncle Tungsten by Oliver Sacks, highly recommended. Um, and he talks about a periodic table display in the Kensington Science Museum, which he used to visit as a child. Uh, and I thought he meant a table. He talks about a periodic table with samples on it. And I thought, wow, that's cool. You know, a periodic table, table. You know, wouldn't that be fun? But it turns out I was just, that's not what he meant. It's actually on the wall. Um, same as every other periodic table. But that was sufficiently disappointing that I thought I, I really need to fix that problem. Um, and so I built this thing. Um, and uh, it has little compartments underneath each element where you can put a sample. And so in about a year, it looked like this. Uh, and a year after that, it looked like this. Um, and a year after that, Oliver Sacks came to visit it. And this is a picture of him at the periodic table, which his poor writing inspired. Um, this is the 2002 Ig Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which if you're not familiar with the Ig Nobels, they're these sort of joke prizes. Uh, it was awarded for the construction of a periodic table table. Um, so, um, you know, this, this being the 90s, uh, because I had a peculiar collecting hobby, it was required by law that I have a website about it. Um, so I put up periodictabletable.com, which catalogs my collection of elements. Um, and, uh, you know, it started out looking kind of 1990s-ish. Um, I later graduated to periodictable.com, which is a much higher rent district in terms of URLs, um, and uh, put up a somewhat more elegant website. Um, one of the problems, though, with, with websites is that you can't make money on them. Uh, and, you know, I, I realize in this audience probably that's a, you know, people are giving me dirty looks, you know, why would you want to make money? Things should be free. Um, and, you know, free is great. Um, you know, I think Wikipedia is an absolute wonder of the world and I'm tremendously grateful not only to Jimmy Wales but also to all of the employers who give jobs and income to the people who contribute to it. Uh, because if they didn't, then there wouldn't be a Wikipedia. You know, somebody's got to, people have to eat, you know, somebody has to, to pay you. Um, and the web for this type of material is not a way in which it's possible to earn enough money um, for that actually to be your job, your occupation for most people. Um, uh, you know, the people who make a lot of money on the web are aggregators who, you know, the ultimate example being Google, but people who bring together the creative work of many different people and package it up into, you know, various different sorts of aggregating websites. That, that's a way to make money. Um, but the number of individual bloggers or, you know, writers, creative people who make money enough to, to live off of on the web alone is extremely small. Um, and so, you know, somewhat ironically, actually, it's quite common for people who have a successful website to cash in, as it were, um, with a print book like this, for example. Um, and I, I think you can point to any number of examples of uh, uh, people who have parlayed their web stardom into money, but not on the web, but through, through some other sort of publishing endeavor. Um, this, for example, has sold about 300,000 copies in 14 languages. Um, and that's like money you could live off of. Not very well, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's actually something that the rewards the creative professional in a way that can sustain them. Um, some pictures from the book. Um, um, so, you know, that's, that's what I did in uh, September of 2009 because it seemed like I had a lot of stuff and wouldn't it be nice to publish a book. Um, 
and publishing it in electronic form didn't seem like an option. Uh, but then, all of a sudden, Steve Jobs came from on high and kind of did what he did for the music industry where he took a world where free reigned and turned it into a world where people would actually pay. Not much, but a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, so when I saw the iPad announcement, my immediate thought was, wow, this is a device on, and, a, and a marketplace and a philosophy and a psychological positioning of things in which we could actually publish this um, and, uh, you know, and, and have that be an interesting proposition. Um, so, uh, and, and also the fact that I happen to be sitting on not just a static photo of each object, but a complete 3D rotation of every one um, that we've been building up for no discernible reason for several years. Um, it, it sort of, you know, kind of came together and seemed like a good idea. Uh, and, and for those of you who follow these things, that, that there was a two-month interval between when the thing was announced and when it shipped. So we kind of took a few minutes to consider the question and decided that we should take those two months to invent a new sort of electronic book and build it and ship it. Um, this was not necessarily possible, but we figured out kind of a way to do it. Uh, Mathematica actually turned out to be very useful in that enterprise because we could use it as a development environment to create the tools necessary to create the sort of experience we wanted people to have. Um, so an example of a, one of the, the, the components of the tool that I built to make the elements possible. Um, everything is, is highly automated because there wasn't much time for manual work nor money to pay for people to do it. Um, so uh, we got it done, we shipped it. It was, it was on the initial, uh, in the app store on the day that the iPad shipped and that was very nice. Um, and uh, we've sold 175,000 copies of the iPad app, um, which uh, considering that we're the publisher of it as opposed to merely the author and Apple gives us 70% of the revenue, um, this is, you know, it's, it's a thing that you can make a living on. Definitely. Um, and that's, I think, really quite a revolutionary thing, uh, that this is an environment in which a person who has an idea and um, the skill to turn it into a product can actually expect that to be their professional occupation, their, the way that they earn a living, not that they have some other job and they put stuff up for free or they contribute to some open source community or whatever they actually don't do anything else in their life, that's their job, and that's how they earn their money. Uh, and that opens up the opportunity for a lot more different kinds of people um, to engage in this, this sort of creative activity because it's economically viable to do so. Um, uh, so um, once we realized that the elements was you know, potentially something that would be um, you know, interesting and useful and that people might like it and might buy it, we thought, well, maybe we should do more of them. Uh, maybe we should, in fact, set up a company to do more of them. So we founded a company, uh, Touch Press, um, which is, uh, it was invented about a week before we shipped it as, to, to be the publisher of it. Um, and uh, the, the mandate of Touch Press essentially is to uh, experimentally determine what the, the format and structure and, and economics of electronic books ought to be. Um, and I don't mean, uh, you know, the, the current definition of, like, of, e of e-books, which are basically, you know, PDF files or whatever that you display on a static screen. Um, I think there's much more interesting potential, much more that can be done um, uh, in, in terms of figuring out what sorts of interesting media can be created when you have an economic model that allows one to make substantial investments in the development of the product. Uh, you know, if you spend $100,000 developing a book, you want to know that there's, you know, that that money will be, will be earned back. And, um, oops, what just happened? Um, right. Uh, and, and the uh, current market for apps allows one to make that sort of investment with a straight face and with a reasonable expectation of, um, of its being a, a, a at least break-even proposition. Um, so we, we, have, we have a fairly good idea of what we think 
it's necessary to put together to make a really interesting electronic publishing uh, publication. Um, so the first thing you need above and beyond anything else is an author. Um, you need somebody who can write, uh, not, not sort of a hack, you know, but an actual author who can put together a story and make it compelling, make it something people want to read. Um, if an, an e-book wouldn't stand as a paper book, then it probably isn't a good book. Um, uh, and this is actually one of the reasons why um, uh, software and multimedia companies, generally speaking, don't come up with interesting e-books because they don't understand the value of authors. Trad traditional print publishers understand very clearly the, the, the value and the importance of having the right author. Um, the second thing you need is uh, real software developers, not flash hackers and script kiddies and, and such. Um, and this is something that game and computer companies understand very clearly. They know that it's the programmers. This talk will be used at an Apple conference tomorrow, so these are all Apple developers. But um, uh, traditional print publishers don't understand this. They think that software is something that you pay $5,000 for a flat rate and certainly wouldn't give them a royalty or anything like that um, because they don't really understand that software developers, software engineers, designers are every bit as important to the quality of an electronic experience as the author is. Um, and the third thing that you need is um, the experience and perspective of the film and television world, because these are very visual sorts of things. There's, there's interactive media, um, there's live action video, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, and you really need to have both the, um, the, the, the sort of skill set and the philosophy of a uh, media producer. Um, so we have sort of brought these things together in Touch Press, um, which is a partnership between myself and Stephen Wolfram and Max Whitby, who hopefully is in the audience here somewhere. Otherwise, I have no way of getting to where I'm getting to my next talk. Yes, there he is. Uh, so Max is a, a uh, former BBC producer with many, many, many shows under his belt. Uh, for uh, the BBC and, and others um, as a film and television producer. And so his experience is, is, and, uh, and skills and Rolodex are, are crucial, I think, to the, to the production of interesting new titles. Um, and uh, what we're doing basically is exploring the question of whether it's possible to run a company on the basis of being an interactive ebook publisher. This has been tried in the past, in the 90s, for example, by a number of people, um, and it didn't work. Uh, as, as mentioned, it didn't work because of distribution problems, because of the web, um, and uh, because there was no device on which people actually wanted to read these things. Um, but now, we'll see. Um, so, uh, actually, if we could have sound off the computer. Right. So. Um, this is uh, just a, a quick little vignette from our latest, um, just recently released solar system app. Um, the, each, each of our apps we've decided needs to have a theme song. Um, and at the very end, uh, if there's time, I'll play you the theme song from the elements um, in Japanese because we recently uh, did a Japanese version of its theme song. Um, this is the theme song for the solar system app uh, and the accompanying video. This is actually unreleased, uh, otherwise unreleased music by Bjork, um, who very kindly uh, gave us this wonderful piece of sort of celestial music. Um, uh, and if we have time at the end, I will actually uh, demo the solar system. Um, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to show that little example. Um, you know, the result of sort of combining these skill sets, we hope, is something that has the sort of the comfort level and the, the uh, you know, you can curl up with it aspect of a book. You can sit down, you can read it, you can experience it. Um, but at the same time, it has the dynamic visual interest of a movie or of a television show and the interactivity of a piece of software where you can really, you know, get your hands on it and, 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 uh, and play with it. Um, so uh, an important thing that, that we decided very early on in the process is that um, although many of our products are of great interest to teachers and students and are in fact very popular with, with kids in particular, I'm surprised how many 
parents and students write me about the Elements book, um, we really don't want to be a textbook publisher. Um, uh, th these are not textbooks at all. It's not a chemistry textbook. It's much more analogous to the sort of enrichment material you might find in a school library. Um, uh, you know, the books that the kids seek out instead of the textbook because they're more interesting. Um, or the books that parents get for their kids because they would like them to, you know, to, they would like to spark an interest in science or whatever. Um, and also because um, I, I don't think there's a market for textbooks anymore. I think the, uh, the textbook publishers have essentially dug themselves into a hole so deep that they will never get out of it. Uh, the, the pricing policies have pushed it to the point where a school district or, or in the case of higher ed, a, a parent or a student can buy an iPad for less than the cost of a semester's worth of textbooks, which is, of course, ludicrous. Um, the, the, the books don't have to cost that much, but they do. And this has created the opportunity for them to be replaced completely by electronic uh, textbook readers. And the wonderful thing about electronic textbook readers is that professors and other people who write the content of textbooks are actually very happy to do it for free for the most part. They're not in it for the money. Uh, and the only reason that, that commercial publishers have been involved in the textbook industry is because professors don't know how to go to China and arrange for printing and container ships full of paper coming back and distribution mechanisms. That's not something professors are good at. Professors, however, are excellent at creating high quality educational materials. And with an electronic reader and uh, a, you know, and a, and a, a notion of um, free open source curriculum materials, there's no need for the, the rapacious commercial publisher in between anymore. Um, and if you look around, you'll see there's, you know, many, many wonderful um, efforts at creating open source textbooks and curriculum materials, very high quality, carefully tuned to each of the state standards in the U.S. and I'm sure around here too. Um, and that's great. So that way people don't have to, uh, you know, have this intermediary of a commercial publisher in the core function of education. Um, it does mean, however, that there's not much money in textbooks in the future. Um, however, I do think that people will pay for enrichment materials. And as a person who wants to actually make enough money on this enterprise uh, uh, for it to be a full-time occupation, this makes me think we should publish enrichment materials, things that people actually want to buy because they're fun and interesting and that contribute to education um, by, you know, by inspiration and by showing people that um, you know, science or whatever the particular topic is, uh, is a thing that's, you know, that, that's interesting and, and fun and worth doing. Um, so uh, that's a kind of purely selfish reason for concentrating on, on uh, enrichment rather than textbooks. Um, so uh, we plan to make a bunch of these. Um, we have, uh, we're running this sort of like a, a production company. We have multiple teams working on projects in parallel. Um, expect half a dozen or so this year, maybe more. Um, and we intend for this to be a, you know, a profit-making commercial enterprise. We'll see if that's actually going to work or not. So far, it's looking good. Um, sales of the elements are great. Sales of solar system are great. Um, uh, there's also, we think, room for many more interesting interactive electronic publications than we can publish ourselves. And because we come from a background in, in uh, package software development, um, we're also making the, the technology stack that we've developed available for licensing to other publishers, um, uh, particularly, for example, the embedded Wolfram Alpha engine that, uh, that is part of the elements that brings up lots of information about each thing. This is available as a, um, as a piece of technology that textbook publishers, for example, could license. Um, and uh, we have... Um, a variety of other examples of deployment of that technology that's available. And we're also working with many partners to bring our technology to their uh, suite of books and their other uh, IP that they have. Um, so let's see, I have, according to my timer, 52 seconds left, um, which is just about enough time for the theme song of the elements in Japanese, if we could bring the sound up. Um, so what this is saying is that in 1959, Tom Lehrer recorded um, the, his famous song, The Elements, which was simply every 
name of every chemical element. Um, this is the same song in Japanese, um, which you can get in the Japanese version of my app. Um, the girl on the corner there, which one YouTube commenter described them as uh, disembodied fembot heads, which I thought was perfect. Um, uh, her name is Angelina and she's 13. She's actually my first cousin once removed. Um, That's her twin sister. Okay, well that's probably enough now. We could have questions. Yeah, hey, thank you very much for that. It's, uh, I have to say, we, we've been using this particular application for a long time with my children, and, and it's genuinely inspiring. And I, I do hold with, with you, and we've spoken about this at length, I remember in the, in the States, um, you know, the, the, the days of the textbook are numbered um, as, a, as an artifact. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly dull, it's very sort of linear. I think if um, Stephen Berlin Johnson said if the book was invented today, it would be banned uh, as a very solitary type of experience. So I think that these kind of things are are, are definitely the, the way ahead. Um, what, one of the questions that, that I do have, though, is how do I share it? I mean, the, you know, when we buy a textbook, we put it on the shelf. Um, I, I lend it to a friend. I mean, I'm, I'm ignoring copyright for, for a while. But you know what I mean? We, you know, we, that, that's one of the things about the books. It's very easy. If I'm paying $7.99 for the elements, how do I then lend, lend it to someone? Because you know, Apple have made it very uh, difficult for us to share an iPad because it's a very personal device. You share your iPad and everyone's got access to all your stuff. So h how does that work? How, how, do we, how, how do you see that emerging as a, as a, I mean, as a model? First of all, I, I, I think, I mean, I, the, the days of the textbook, I think, are numbered. I think the days of the print book in general, I don't think are numbered at all. Um, I think that of all the print media, books is the one that's going to last the longest. Uh, you know, daily newspaper, for example, it's just nuts. If you don't have a parrot, there's absolutely no reason to subscribe to a paper newspaper. Um, so, uh, you know, because they have, it has no value the next day, mm. you know. Um, it's much better to receive that in an electronic form. It's, it's, it's ephemeral, it's transient, it, it shouldn't come on paper. This is an object that if I give this to you with an inscription on it, you know, 50 years from now, if you're still alive, it's probably sitting on your shelf somewhere. Oh, we, we and, have this. You know, and you might pull it out and flip it around. The, the fact that it's a physical object is a valuable attribute of it, unlike in the case of a newspaper, where it's, it's nothing but a detriment. Um, and, and, you know, gift giving. You can wrap this up and put it under a tree, uh, which is very difficult to do with a gift code. Um, people try. You know, they make little boxes, but it's just not the same thing. Uh, and, you know, f books have intrinsic physical value and are perceived as that. And that, I think, is going to make them last a lot longer. Textbooks, not. Um, you know, textbooks are something you want to use for the minimum possible length of time and then forget ever existed. Um, so, you know, they, they really are much more appropriate in an electronic form. And, and so, you know, the question of sharing, uh, hopefully, in the case of textbooks, is solved by the fact that they're just free. Right. And that's great. That is the, a perfect example of where free is the right model. Um, for a book like this, to share it between devices, that's kind of a policy decision, which I am ever so thankful that it's up to Apple and not me <laughs> um, to make that decision. Because that way I can just say, look, it's not my choice, it's Apple. And if, when, you know, if and when we release an Android version, which we will, um, then we may have to have a, a deeper think about that. Well, because it does impact um, your business model, doesn't it? I mean, you were saying that the metrics work, because as a publisher, you can now think, right, we can produce this app, uh, we can sell this many companies, we know I get right. this much revenue back. Right. Then, if you go into a more of an open source model, you're back to a piracy, effectively, and then you're, and you're back to not being is, able to create that is good works. Number, right, I mean, the question is, you know, we have a bank account with $100,000 in it. Should we take that and spend it on the creation of another really interesting, inspirational thing that people will love and give to their children and will advance the world. We're not going to do that. We're not going to throw away $100,000 unless we have a reasonable expectation of making it back again and maybe a little more. Um, and on the iPad right now, because of the police state that, that, that Apple has created there and because of its draconian you know, policies, we can do that. Um, other, you know, and it's like, I mean, I feel the conflict, yeah. right? Yeah, no, of course. But 
the fact is, this is money, we're not gonna throw it away. And it is an open question, I think, whether the Android market is one in which the psychology of the situation is, is such that people will actually pay, or will they just take it, I don't know. I think it's much more to do with psychology than, tech, than, than, than technology. Interesting point. Um, Let's take one question before we break for coffee. Um, we have a quick round, we get the microphones. There's a gentleman just over here in the, in the back, in the third row in. Thank you. Um, my name's Robert Campbell, I'm from a company called Ecomnet, we're technologists. Uh, just on your last point there, uh, Amazon are seeking to create yet a, another Android marketplace, and one which they're hoping is going to be policed in a similar way, although it's not clear yet precisely how, um, to Apple. Do you think that might actually influence that particular market way in a very positive well, way? Well, Amazon and at least three others that I can think of off the top of my head are creating competitive marketplaces, um, each with its own particular flavor and its own particular um, you know, theory about what apps should cost. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, who knows? I mean, the amount of fragmentation in the Android market is mind-boggling, uh, not only at the level of devices, um, but also at the level of markets. And then there's China. You know, don't even get me started on China uh, in terms of what market is going to be the important one there. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's another reason why we haven't leapt into Android right away is because it's extremely unclear what, what market one should be putting one's apps in. And unfortunately, because these are, you know, these are quite um, you know, resource-intensive apps, uh, it's not like we can just say, well, we'll do it on all the markets, or we'll do it on all devices, and you know, we, it's a lot of work to port to different environments, different particular subgenres of Android. Um, I think that things will settle out, and we'll see if they settle out into a world where everything is pretty much free and ad-supported, uh, in which case I don't think we can do it, uh, or if it will settle out into a world where there exists somewhere a pocket that you know, the expectation is that these are commercial products and you shouldn't steal them. Uh, you should just pay for them and don't feel so, you know, don't feel like you're dumb for paying for it. It's okay. You know, that, that's the number one thing that Jobs has done is he's made it psychologically acceptable for people to pay for things where in the past they felt foolish doing so. Uh, and if there's an Android market that develops that same psychological profile, then we'll leap on it. I would agree. We're going to take a break now for the coffee. Thank you very much, Teo, and round of applause.